Hey, James, I'm welcome, back, welcome baby. Back. I'm back. I, I don't know how these episodes are going to roll out, so I don't know if you guys missed me or whatever, but if you follow me on Instagram, at James Pumphrey, you yeah. would have seen that I had a little scare. Uh, what What did you have? My heart exploded. Not. It just wasn't working very well. <laughs> I had a heart attack at 34. Yeah. Which was pretty scary. It was less scary than I thought it would be. What did it feel like? Uh just like my back really hurt, like my shoulders, like down in my bones, and then my right arm started hurting, and my right hand went numb. And I was like, I'm going to the hospital. Wow. Yeah. You, you drove yourself to the hospital. And I drove right? myself to the hospital. And I got in there, and I was like, yo, I got chest pains. And shouts to UCLA Hospital oh, yeah. for saving your boy's life. Um, so they got chest pains. I guess you go straight to the front of the line. And then they did some tests, and they were like, hey, you had a heart attack, we think. And then they were like, we're checking you in the hospital. So then I went upstairs, and then I had an angiogram, which is where... This is my only incision. I'm pointing to a tiny oh, little yeah. dot on my right wrist. So they went all the way up my artery into my heart, and I saw my heart in a monitor. Whoa. Which is sick. And just to, you know, point out how smart doctors are, and I was looking at it, and I was like, looks pretty good. <laughs> and then the guy came up to me. He's like, it's real bad. So I had 100% blockage, and there's three arteries that go to your heart. Yeah. I had 100% blockage in two of oh them. Oh, my God. How were you even alive? I was barely alive, man. Um, but, yeah, so then they put what's called a stint in one of them. Um, the one that was the blockage that probably caused this heart attack. And then one of them was so old that they couldn't do it. But that one has built what's called, um, I forget what it's called, but other arteries from itself it's grown wow. them into my heart so that one has decent blood flow um, right, so do you have the option of clearing that blockage ever or would that that'd be a crazy yeah. surgery I, I imagine it would probably be like a bypass situation so one of the reasons they didn't give me a bypass this time is because i'm so young um and they can really only do that a couple times okay so you're I mean, so if you have I'm, to, they're, save, they're saving those options for later. Right, yeah. So chances are I will have open heart surgery at some point in my wow. life. Great. Have that to look yeah. forward to. Yeah, man. It was um, – that was a, a strange experience, I think, for everyone in the office because, you know, it's kind of like, oh, no, daddy's in the hospital. I'm not daddy. <laughs> I'm <laughs> the QB. <laughs> All right. Our, okay, our quarterback's in the yeah. hospital. Um, it was just a weird week after that Uh I don't know. I, I certainly felt not less motivated, but like, oh shit, like what? Yeah, I've noticed there's a do? lot more doctor's appointments going on. Yeah. Oh, at I got the office. I went to UCL UCLA Health. Oh uh, yeah, dude. I got my I got a, a checkup a physical mm -hmm. on uh Wednesday. You play with your balls? No, actually they don't do that anymore. No, th what? No. They did it with me. Oh well. Maybe you're not old enough. <laughs> I'm thirty four. <laughs> they checked my ballsies. Yeah, uh, well, my doctor was like, they don't, uh, even the American Cancer Institute says, stop bugging them boys by touching their balls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, this is the Pascast, the number one uh, ball talk podcast <laughs> on iTunes. Thanks for listening. James, we're very glad to have you back. Thanks, um, man. It's good to be back. Yeah. I got so bored. You're only at home for like a week, though. I was right? at home for two weeks. Two weeks. Or I was out for like two weeks. But I watched. I started watching Nurse Jackie in the hospital as a joke. So when the <laughs> nurses came in, they were like, oh, weird. Um, and then I ended up watching all of it last week. That's hilarious. So I watched seven seasons of Nurse Jackie. Okay. It's not a very good show. I was going to say, like, I, I was thinking about what I would do if I was in your position having time off like that. Just jerk it. Uh, blazing and glazing for sure. <laughs> um but also, yeah, catching up on the, all the sweet prestige television that we have available to us now. Yeah. Uh, I don't really watch a lot of TV, surprisingly. It's great. TV's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Turn off this podcast. I just watch wanna, some TV. Yeah. I just want to <laughs> give a shout out to TV and all the streaming services out there. Amazon Prime, uh, Netflix, Hulu for getting me through those two weeks at home when I just had to sit on the couch and cuddle with my pup. Yeah, that, that's it. But uh, yeah, I cheated death. Yeah. So pretty much I'm immortal and I'm ready to talk about I cars again. <laughs> no, I can't do anything now. I have to, and I just, 
it there are lifestyle changes that I have to make, mm -hmm. but well, it's crazy because like a, a, so genetic. The day before that happened, you were like, "Yo, dude, when are we gonna hit that gym? When are mm -hmm. we gonna do this?" I was like, "I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> now, like, yeah, now, or uh, in four weeks when I'm nice. able to. Because I went to the gym. I've been going to the gym this week. Got my doctor's appointment. Watched a documentary called The Game Changers. Everyone about, has been texting me like, "You should watch this documentary." Well, Rutledge. I ran into Rutledge Wood randomly at the mall mm -hmm. a few days ago, and he's like, yeah, I got, you got to watch this documentary. I was like, all right. So I checked it out. Um, read some fact check articles about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they take some liberties, but mm -hmm. I think the idea of like a, a primarily vegetable-based diet is probably a good idea. If nothing else, for the environmental impact. Yeah. So, Lots of reasons, the, not the least of which is staying alive. Yes. Good. Um, That's, which is fun being yeah. a lot of fun Best Ass Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. let's get into our story this week uh when we uh this is ford landio part two it's been a while since we did part one <laughs> we recorded yeah. part one probably a month ago now uh and then just of the way we scheduled it and with uh james heart condition uh we have to pick up today so but the, for you it's probably last yeah week. it's probably last week for you guys Time's different for us. Whoa. Okay, so when we last left off, Ford's man Blakely and his motley crew had just arrived at the proposed site of Ford's Brazilian empire and began clearing the land. Blakely had arrived to the site without any real set-in-stone plans. So when it came to designing the future home of 25,000 workers and 100,000 additional residents, he just winged it. Like you do. In his designs, Blakely put a lot of emphasis on having toilets and outhouses, claiming Good. it was the key step to bring forth a new race, which Ew. is yeah. not problematic at <laughs> <No>. all. <laughs> he was not an engineer, but certainly, certainly liked to play one. When Blakely and his team arrived on location, no progress on the site had been made because, remember, the ships just got there and there's no way to get anything off the ships. Mm -hmm. So it's just... They're stuck they're just in the mud. They're chilling, yeah. It had taken them months to even unload the simplest of supplies to the area, let alone the equipment to manufacture an entire town. But the people made do. They erected temporary structures for the workers, uh, the white workers anyway, Jeez. and began working by hand. At this time... Ford had a reputation of being the immaculate motor car company. The Detroit plants were regularly cleaned and given a fresh coat of paint. Uh, I think about every year they had a new coat of paint on there. Henry Ford was quoted as saying, One cannot have morale without cleanliness. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what a creepy thing. That's like a mom with Munchausen by proxy yeah. or whatever. Just like. He must be clean. <laughs> it's like uh, Howard Hughes, the flashbacks oh, yeah. and the aviator. That's another movie I watched while I was up. But like, they just keep flashing back to like his mom making him wash with like black soap. Yeah. It was just like, sounds like something she'd say. That image of perfection was what followed Ford, at least until they received a telegram from Fordlandia that read about <laughs> 30 out of 104 sick. No deaths, but plenty of malaria. <laughs> no deaths, but plenty of malaria. <laughs> so, death will be coming. Ooh, that is bad news. Yeah, the conditions at the site were shit. <laughs> Literally, it was disgusting without a trash can in sight. Yeah, I can't imagine they brought a lot of those. On top of it all, Blakely was already failing on what he thought was the most important part of any colonization attempt. The turlets! <laughs> With such immediate failure... What could possibly bring civility to the savage lands now? It's like when you go on a trip and you get to your hotel room and you're like, I forgot a toothbrush and toothpaste. I was going to say phone charger, but. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's toothpaste and toothpaste is hygiene. Mm -hmm. That's a. I don't understand why all hotels don't have a toothbrush and toothpaste. They should. I don't need conditioner. No. I don't need lotion that well, stinks. Yeah. I don't need, I don't need stinky, <laughs> smelly lotion. I need toothbrush. Toothbrush. Yeah. Toothpaste. The crew lived in these terrible conditions for months, waiting for the day that the boats would arrive, bringing the heavy machinery necessary to make any progress. Until then, they were forced to do everything by hand. Uh, since their arrival, they had only managed to clear out one of a few hundred acres expected. One acre of land they cleared. What a bunch of maroons. <laughs> and 
clearing the area was by far the most important part. They were building a rubber plantation, after all, and that required space. The most efficient way to clear a vast area of land was to burn the Amazon. Toot toot! And that's exactly what they did. Or yeah. at least tried to do, at least, James. I should remind you that Blakely would not have gotten this job if it wasn't for sheer nepotism. Because Blakely was an idiot, normally you would try to burn the trees during the dry season when the trees are dry. Uh-huh. But... Blakely decided to try and do it during the rainy season <laughs> and was repeatedly frustrated when it kept raining and putting out his fires. To fight back against these acts of God, he used copious amounts of kerosene to keep the fires burning. These kerosene-fueled fires turned into the biggest fires the Amazon had ever seen, forcing all native wildlife out of their habitats. Crying, screaming, and bellowing with terror. Ugh. He was at a quote from because it sounds like he's bragging. I think so. Man, all them animals were so scared of my fire. <laughs> Blakely started to resent the Ford Motor Company, surprisingly, claiming he was not being paid enough for how much time and effort and kerosene he was putting in. He had been forced to sell his house and lose track of his investments. Oh, no. <laughs> after spending so much time in Brazil, and he was angry about it. But Henry Ford wasn't hearing it and refused to increase Blakely's already substantial salary. So that is when Blakely started doing what any enterprising businessman would do. He started skimming a little bit of money off the tap. He would overcharge workers for necessary supplies and sleeping arrangements and began deducting transportation costs from employees' paychecks. Soon after, Blakely was relieved of his duty at Ford Motor Company. His sudden departure led to a collapse in what little authority there was at the work camp. No one took responsibility for feeding or paying the camp's now 380 men strong workforce, and the temperature of 106 degrees Fahrenheit was creating a bit of tension down at the Fordlandia. You're doing a weird thing with your computer. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that, man? Just like getting on a boat. It's the worst. And it's... going down, just like everything's going wrong. It's 106 degrees. They start stealing your money. Mm hmm. None of the machine, like you're doing everything by hand because you can't even get the machines off the freaking boat. Everything's on fire. Yep. It's hot. It's gonna get a lot worse. You have malaria. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna get. Worse. What is? What do you do? What happens when you get malaria? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. I think you have a fever, a really high fever. Do you uh, poop yourself? I'm. All diseases make you poop yourself. That's I not assume. true. <laughs> you get a rash. Oh no. Profuse sweating, headache, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea. There you go. Uh, so, yeah, that sounds horrible. Yeah. The lack of protective gear for workers and the rotten food they were served combined with the sweltering <laughs> heat led, surprisingly, to riots. Yeah! The rioters armed themselves with machetes and cutlasses and chased the Americans into the woods or out into the river in boats. It wasn't until Brazilian native uh, Jorge... Valares, I'm going to say Jorge Valares, a coffee producer, an elevator manufacturer. Hmm. Interesting. Um, that's a weird combo. That had accompanied Blakely to Brazil, got involved. That peace was able to be restored. Valares killed two steers to feed the men and promised they would get their wages as long as they promised not to hurt any more of the Americans. Valares was the only person at the site who could speak both languages, and he was heavily involved in much of the shady dealings involved with Ford acquiring and illegally burning so much land. So he's kind of like the fixer, but also he's a fixer in two senses, like mm -hmm. dealing with uh, the Brazilians, but also screwing the Brazilians too, it sounds like. Right. And I just like, it's just another sign of the hubris that Ford had where it's like, yeah, I think one guy who speaks the language yeah. <laughs> is probably good. What are we sending, like, the, 100 dudes down there? Yeah. Vel uh, this is already making me so mad. I'm so mad. Valaris stayed until he was injured in another riot. <laughs> and his co-conspirator, Governor Bentez, re requested him to leave, as details of the entire scandal were about to be made public. So the they're going to be found out, and they're like, hey, you got to get out of there right now, otherwise... You're going to die. Yeah. As it turns out, Ford had bribed enough to get the land, but not enough to keep it quiet. 
Uh, Governor Bentez, who had helped Ford illegally bypass multiple import taxes, left office in 1929 to, replaced, to be replaced by Governor Valle. While being sworn in, Governor Valle stated that he would review and revise, if necessary, the Ford concession. Um, great speak right there. Just, yeah, I'll check it out if ne- I mean, if yeah. I have to, you know. Uh, the first of which involved taxing the business fairly for materials being brought into construct the town. Between 1929 and 1931, the company's tax bill soared. Dude, this is like three years. Yeah. <laughs> like, I hate camping for like two days. <laughs> this I, is just giving me so much anxiety. I don't even know if I should be here. Oh, no. Well, if it gets too much. <laughs> My blood pressure is yeah. going to go through the roof. Um, Felipe, can, he can sub in. Uh, I have some nitroglycerin in my pocket. Just like, just Carol, like Carol Shelby. Carol, Carol Shelby had some. Can I see those? Yeah. Are they flavored? Can I try one? <laughs> <laughs> no, dude. They give you such a bad headache. That's a tiny little thing. Yeah, you put it under your tongue. Is it a droplet thing? No, it's little tiny uh, pills. Oh. They dissolve under your tongue. Wow. So this is what Carol Shelby had in his mouth when he was racing his last race. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool that he had a headache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. The company's tax bill soared, and it be, became simply too expensive to keep importing materials to finish Fordlandia. What? You're in the Amazon. You yeah. have the materials. There's a lot of trees. <laughs> Back then, there was even more. Yeah. Oh, quit, by, quit burning the trees. Start chopping. Start making yeah. some log cabins, <laughs> you goons. By March of 1931, 16,000 tons of Ford's goods still sat unused in customs warehouses. Inefficient. Uh, after all the trouble that Blakely had caused, Ford appointed Captain A.N.R. Oxholm as Fordlandia's new manager. This guy sounds like a Nazi. Yeah. I am Einar Oxholm. Captain Einar Oxholm. <laughs> <laughs> he had initially joined the company in 1928 as one of the ship captains on the voyage over to the Amazon. Ford hated hiring experts. In fact, one of his major points of pride was that he found it necessary to get... uh, You know what? You should read this quote. Found it necessary to get rid of a man as soon as he thinks himself an expert. Yeah, so, I mean, I I need a new manager for this giant factory I want to build. I'm going to... I'm going to go with an amateur. With the captain of the boat. (laughs) (laughs) The guy who drove us here. Yeah. That's like... Being like, oh, I need a CEO for this company. What's our Uber driver doing? (laughs) Oxholm was tasked with trying to clean up the problems Blakely had left behind. Initially, it seemed to be no different with him in charge, though. (laughs) One of Oxholm's first major blunders appeared when it came time to unload the ships. He insisted that the only correct way to unload was to do it himself. That's bad management, as I've learned. Yeah. Unfortunately, that... The process took about three months and cost the company close to $100,000. But other than that, things seem just swimmingly with Oxholm in charge. Good management is uh, delegation. Delegation, which I... It's hard. Sometimes it's just easier to do it yourself than teach someone how to do it, but you got to teach someone how to do it, because in the long run, you'll save time. That's something I've been trying to learn lately. Yeah, man. I want to take a second to thank our sponsor for this week, Mac Weldon. Mac Weldon makes men's premium essentials like socks, shirts, and underwear. They believe in smart design, and their products are made out of some of the best premium fabrics available. Take a look at what you're wearing now. I bet it's not as comfortable as you'd like it to be. I bet it kind of itches and kind of feels weird and just like tight and sticking to your skin. You're too wear your skin. Mac Weldon makes the most comfortable socks, the most comfortable hoodies, the most comfortable underwear, the most comfortable shirts, most comfortable sweatpants that you'll ever wear. And if you're a naturally stinky boy like me, you'll love their antimicrobial underwear and shirts that eliminate odor. That's crush when you're on set all day just sweating in someone else's car. Mac Weldon wants us to be as comfortable as possible. So if you order one of their products and are not 100% satisfied, they'll give you a refund and you get to keep the product. No questions asked. Their site is really easy to bop around and they have an amazing selection of products, fabrics, and colors. I can't wait to get back in my sweatpants. For 20% off your first order, head over to MacWeldon.com and enter the promo code GAS. That's M A C K W H E L D O N dot com. Promo code 
gas. By the end of 1929, the Brazilian workforce in Fordlandia had grown from a few hundred to over 1,000. Why are people going there? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, no one's tweeting about it. Yeah, I guess so. Like nowadays, you just get on the tweets, you'd be like, the guys, I'm not going down there. Those guys don't even have any turlets. Oxholm spent the majority of his time studying the magic of city planning. He built an administrative office, a makeshift hospital, workshops, and even designed blueprints for houses. Aside from all this planning, he still had a lot of work to do, though. The ground had yet to be cleared still or leveled, and then the roads had to be built, uh, and then the trees had to be planted. <laughs> More importantly, Oxholm still had to build the town. The workers were still miserable. Uh, three workers quit for every one hired, <laughs> <laughs> forcing the foreman to spend most of their time hiring instead of actually getting work done. But back in North America, it was hypothesized that the low job retention rate was due to life being too easy in the bountiful Amazon. These guys are just down there, just drinking. Sipping pina coladas. Pina coladas. I assume. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> to help encourage the recruitment process, Henry Ford said that he would pay at least 25 to 35 percent more than the local wage. However, most of the Fordlandia staff had a hard time translating that into actual cash, as most of the river economies were calculated in kind and credit. So no one knew what 25 to 35 percent increase would actually look like, because it's just a lot of like bartering and mm -hmm. just doing things because you can. Yeah, they don't really have cash. Yeah. Despite all that, the prospects of Fordlandia still attracted many impoverished Brazilians. Soon, more than 5,000 people lived in or around the plantation. Oxholm couldn't keep up with the growth, though, and soon small shanty towns began sprouting up along the river at the camp. The plantation had about a 300% turnover rate, and in order to keep a payroll of 2,000, they had to hire about 6,000 people on top of that. To like, mm -hmm. That's crazy. With all these new people and new service economies in the surrounding villages, the plantation became a mecca for all undesirables, even criminals, of the entire Amazon Valley. Sounds fun. Uh, little cafes, restaurants, fruit meat shops began sprouting among the plantation. Oxholm tried to have them Why? destroyed. But the little villages resisted their efforts. When Ford tried to have them evicted from company property, the governor of Brazil put a kibosh on that Real quick, because it turned out that wasn't allowed under Brazilian law. It's like they're building your town. You can't build a town. They built a town. Since the riots in 1928, not much had changed when it came to the poor housing and working conditions. In June of 1929, a knife fight broke out between a yes. Brazilian worker and a man from Santa Lucia, an island north of Brazil. So there's all these people from like the West Indies coming mm -hmm. down to work here too. <laughs> like People are just drawn to this place because they hear of work there, mm -hmm. but nothing is happening yet. The Santa Lucia man stabbed the Brazilian, and the friends of the Brazilian man retaliating, retaliated by almost beating the guy to death. Oxholm blamed the brawl on Brazilian racism, saying, It's impossible to make native workers <laughs> toil against... <laughs> Don't say it. Foreign N-words. Proving once more that colonialism never truly dies. In order to head off a potential riot... Oxham gave all the West Indians some travel money and sent them down the river. The British consul in Bellum uh, disagreed with Oxholm's approach, stating that Oxholm's emphasis on Brazilian prejudice diverted attention from his well-known incompetence. That's a burn. <laughs> pointing out that these groups had worked together before. You know what? The fact that you're so racist really distracts from the fact that you're so stupid. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Those Brits, they know how to... Put a man down. Uh, so yeah, these, I mean, those groups had been working peacefully on the in the Amazon. Yeah, until these buffoons yeah. showed up. But Oxholm had projects much larger than his racism and bigotry. By the end of 1929, 90 people had been buried in the company's cemetery. 62 of them were workers at the plant, and the rest, quote, outsiders who had died on the property. By the end of 1930, that number had tripled to over 270 graves, four of which belonged to Oxholm's own children. Holy crap. It's not looking good down there. No. By the end of 1929, 
Henry Ford had invested over $1.5 million, or 22.5 mil today, and had almost nothing to show for it. He figured he was being screwed over by Brazilian politics and was forced to turn to Washington to help. After sweet-talking President Hoover, Ford was able to organize a meeting with the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America. There's, oh, okay. So they just have a guy... It's not like Latin America as a whole has a Secretary of State. This is a guy in the White House. Gotcha. Ford sent William Cowling, a self-described loyal Fording, over to Brazil. To Fordling. Try to, Fordling, that's an even better word, over to Brazil to try to sort things out. His new approach would be to create relationships with Brazil's politicians and businessmen instead of just isolating the plantation like so many others before him, man. Because they were still like, Ford's philosophy, I think, at this point had just been like, Fordlandia is my sovereign area that mm-hmm. just happens to be in Brazil. I'm not going to deal with anyone else. But now they're trying to like deal with the buro- bureaucracy. After a few weeks of negotiations and boozing up the opposition, Cowling reported back that Brazil's leadership was not to be underestimated. <laughs> Turns out these guys are pretty good. Yeah, I've been partying with these guys for weeks. They're good, man. They're sharks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the corruption obviously went deeper than just messing with this one industry, and it was ultimately not Ford's problem to try to fix. But alas, Ford was still able to regain the trust of many of Brazil's political elite. It was now time for him to take advantage of the newly restored faith and for... For us to exploit the country to the fullest extent. What a piece of shit. I don't like him. When Ford received news of the progress in Fordlandia... Things were looking a bit bleak. You don't say. (laughs) It made a mockery of everything the Ford Motor Company and its state-of-the-art River River Rouge. River Rouge, yeah. And its state-of-the-art River Rouge plant stood for. In fact, they still hadn't even constructed an official dock yet. It's been years since they got there. It's been years. That's the first thing I probably would have built. Yeah, I would have built a dock to get all the crap off the boat. Yeah, you know, if I built a factory in the the Amazon. Yeah, if I went down to the Amazon to build a racist factory. Yeah. I'd my, probably build a dock. Dude, my racism factor? Yeah, I'd have a dock <laughs> right away. <laughs> uh, theft was rampant, and equipment and supplies basically disappeared as soon as they were taken off the boats. Uh, <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah, you know what? Fine. I'm okay Good. with this. Yeah. I like like all these bandits yeah, I'm rooting the for story. The, I'm rooting for the jungle right now. Uh, <laughs> shit was going downhill in Fordlandia yet again. <laughs> Finally, after years of unproductive management... Oxholm was sacked in May of 1930, but later that year in October, things started to look up a bit for the entire project. Getulio Vargas rode to, rose to power in Brazil, where he would dominate for the next 20 years and create the modern Brazilian welfare state. He replaced multiple politicians with people sympathetic to Ford and ultimately lifted the import restrictions that were quote, keeping, or, you know, keeping the entire project from taking off. You know, I'm not sure if that's the main issue. I it's think. just, like, <laughs> incompetence. Yeah. Many of the skilled workers who came to work at the plantation were, quote, prosperity boomers. Okay, boomer. Who had arrived to help, cons- I hope by the time this episode comes out, that's not like a dead meme. Uh, <laughs> oh, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> who had arrived to construct the Panama Canal. Most migrants from Europe and other parts of South America were also skilled workers, but some of them lied about their credentials. One lied about being a rubber expert who had cla- and claimed that to protect the trees from bugs, they had to put Vaseline on the trunks. Mm. As it turns out, though, that kills the trees. Um, <laughs> uh, when it came to rating employees, it seemed that Ford's rampant racism had infected his managers. As it turned out, surprise... Uh, as it turned out, employees were rated on a scale from tameness to savagery Jesus. based purely on their skin tone. These guys are awful. Yeah. You know what? New rule for the past gas. We're only doing fun stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is making me mad. In December of 1930, the water tower was finally finished. It was a 150-foot tall uh, tower and held 150,000 gallons of water. It- That's... Uh- that's a thousand gallons per, per foot, foot tall. tall. Math. <laughs> it became the defining landmark of Fordlandia and surprisingly still stands to this day. As a Christmas present to the site, Ford sent them a factory whistle that wouldn't rust. Stainless steel 
whistle. Great. The whistle basically functioned as a clock most of the time. It was so loud that people not associated with the factory would start using the whistle's scream to map out their day. It's like a church bells. Yeah, but a horrifyingly <laughs> just screeching whistle that probably affected the wildlife. Ford was obsessed with clocks. He could not get enough of time and would not stop and would not stand for anything less than perfect punctuality. As a kid, he would take apart the clocks in his home and piece them back together. Um, that's a weird thing because clocks are very complicated. Very complicated. It's not like you could learn. I mean, I guess you could learn how to put them back together, but that's not a fun one to start out with, I don't think. Anyway, because of his obsession with time, Fordlandia actually operated on Detroit's time zone. Of course. Despite the plantation being nearly an hour ahead. It looked like the end. Nearly an hour ahead. Nearly. What the fuck did that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what time zone is that? Well, I, I th- you know, Detroit's pretty far east, and yeah, but time zones aren't split up in less than an hour. Time, Just dude. Saying. Dude, you know what? Let us know in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> It looked by the end of 1930 that Fordlandia had made it past its rough start and was now in shaky but livable routine. But something tells me it's not going to... Yeah, something tells me this ain't going to (laughs) last. There hadn't been a single major incident between the workers for almost a year now. To encourage a healthy lifestyle, rules were implemented that required all workers to eat at a company dining hall. Uh, Having to wait in line made people angry. Makes me angry. Yep, and they were tired and hungry after all. And on December 20th, 1930, the workers snapped. They decided they would break, quote, break everything they could get their hands on, which they did. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to make people eat at a company store by rule. Nope. No. The Uh, rioting mob destroyed the office building, the powerhouse, sawmill, radio station. Oh, God. (laughs) And even the lights around the plantation. They burned company records, broke time clocks, which really pissed off Ford, and destroyed (laughs) literally everything they could get their freaking hands on. Officials at the plant ordered the evacuation of all Americans and called for Brazilian reinforcements before the mob got to the radio station. Not the radio station. Not the, this is the final straw, the riot. Began on Monday, and there were troops to reclaim the plantation on Tuesday morning. It ended without, surprisingly, it ended without anyone getting hurt, but it was just a sign of things to it's come. It's somehow going to get worse. Now, at this time, the Great Depression was hitting America hard, but Ford had taken this opportunity to enact some social change. Yeah, normally oh. I'm gramming for the change, gram against the man, but I don't think that the social change that Henry Ford likes is the no. same kind of social change that we like. I don't think so. After all, he had only recently been forced to recant his anti-Semitic beliefs. Uh, yeah, he uh, was very... Um, Racist. Racist, yeah. Yeah, as we mentioned in the last episode of Fordlandia, Henry Ford, I just want to remind everybody that Henry Ford had a newspaper that he bought just to print anti-Semitic yeah. uh, propaganda. Not good. It's not like some rumor that he was like kind of racist. Henry no. Ford was a huge, huge, huge open racist yeah. man. Yep. Uh, in fact, there's a book on uh, He wrote a book. Um, you can somehow still buy it on Amazon. Uh, it's eligible for Prime. It's called The International Jew, The World's Foremost Problem, The Complete Four Volumes by Henry Ford. Yeah, he like literally wrote the book on, on being racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not, not, I don't like, I don't know, I don't like him. Yeah, and even, you know... <sighs> <laughs> I just, I can't with Henry Ford's racism can't. right now. I can't. I literally can't with how racist Henry Ford is. Uh, so that mob destroyed the office building, powerhouse, sawmill, and uh, the lights, and that radio station. Uh, Not the radio <laughs> station! How are we going to listen to our drive time jokers? <laughs> uh, okay, so the public... Good Sorry. morning, <laughs> Fordlandia. The the public was catching a glimpse of who Ford was, so um, helping to improve the lives of workers impacted by the pres- the depression was a great PR stunt for him. He actually raised wages from six dollars to seven dollars a day. <sighs> 
Uh, Ford actually welcomed the crash, too. All of his shares were privately held, and he didn't touch the stock market, so his fortunes were completely safe. He believed that the crash was, quote, A cleansing destruction that would wash away the excess of the 1920s from the land. But still, his public image was wearing thin. I wonder why he and his company were being implicated in many of the modern vices he condemned, including uh, prevention or uh, union busting. And some of the Ford from his Iron Mountain sawmill was used for KKK cross burning. So not good. Not a good look for old Henry. (laughs) By 1932, the public was growing wise to what Ford was like and the tragedy and what the tragedy of, quote, Fordism actually was. Books such as Brave New World were being published, exposing Ford's, exposing Ford's philosophy of what it was. Marxist criticized Ford's consistent production, warning him of the crisis of overproduction, to which Ford responded, The day of true overproduction will be the day of emancipation from enslaving materialistic anxieties. He proposed... Uh, solutions to fix the crash, including an industrialized American barn that would fix the farm crisis. But many of his ideas were just harebrained and industrial versions of medieval alchemy. Yeah, he figured out yeah. how to make leather from wood chips, fake leather from wood okay. chips, which is I, pretty cool. That is cool. Um, and then he developed even <laughs> more uses for soybeans. Because remember, Henry Ford loves soybeans. <laughs> To four, uh, I had some tofu yesterday. Did you? Um, I've been trying to, you know, be a little more vegetarian. Uh, kind of messed me up. Yeah. 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 I think you can't just you can't just jump into tofu. Like yeah, that. I think soy affects some people differently. Also, if you do eat kind of like shit, and then you just start eating vegetables all the time, you're like, man, I'm pooping a lot because yeah. your body's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Ooh, what are these vitamins? <laughs> <laughs> to form Ford's industrial utopia, he believed that gardening was the key to his vision of holistic Emersonian self sufficiency. He pushed for gardening to be taught in all of Fordlandia's schools, which really wasn't a terrible idea, but the crew at Fordlandia didn't think so. The only good thing they saw gardening was that it could possibly stop children from messing with the rubber trees and occupy their attention with something else. Uh, also, you can eat the food that comes out of the dirt. Also, fun fact: Ford hated baseball. What? <laughs> so when he needed to promote, so when he needed to promote a sport at Fordlandia, he chose to bring in his favorite <laughs> pastime, golf. He built a small nine-hole golf course on the property. Um, Still at the time. Just want to remind everyone that they still don't have food here. um, And the workers were writing about it. Yeah, but they had a golf course. No, they they got a golf course now. What a white thing. (laughs) That's like the white, like this whole thing has just made me think like, what a white thing. But then this might be the most white thing. I think for sure. A nine hole golf course. Do you play golf ever? Have you ever done it? Yeah, my dad used to make me play golf all the time. How's your short game? Great. (laughs) I, I love it. Asking people that. <laughs> uh, a lot of these schools were there to provide education and opportunity for the American families living on the site, uh, but there was a much larger goal. Ford planned to introduce the, quote, savage Brazilians to American culture and create a new civilized society within the heart of the jungle. Um, this story shares many similarities with other imperialistic horror stories from history, such as the forced re-education of the... Um, Native Americans uh, by uh, Americans, and it's pretty similar to the events in Heart of Darkness, a great book that you should read if you didn't read it in high school. Anyway, Ford didn't stop treating living things like machines, and the most critical example was his method of planting rubber trees. Rubber trees (laughs) needed to be placed in a density of about one to three trees per acre. That's not many trees. That's not a lot at all. That way, they had enough room to spread out and grow, though, as well as to prevent environmental diseases that would harm or kill the trees. But Ford uh, knew nothing about these trees, Mm -hmm. and to get the most bang for his buck, he had them planted in tight rows like you would fruit trees. Ford did not understand how the asexual reproduction of these trees worked and had to bring in an expert from Goodyear to help explain everything. Not Firestone? That is strange. Mm -hmm. In that expert's opinion... 
No rubber man would have gone to Brazil in the first place to build estates. Which was true. It is a dumb <laughs> idea. Mm, probably made up by a dumb, dumb man who doesn't know nothing about trees nor people. <laughs> now, I'm no expert in people, but I am an expert in trees. <laughs> and trees is like people. And trees <laughs> is like people. You put too many of them too close together, they're going to get disease and they ain't going to grow right. <laughs> End quote. Wow. <laughs> all, other pr- all other plantations had been constructed in either Africa or Asia, where there were no natural predators of the rubber trees, but Ford was too oblivious and too racist to accept any of those locations. So, by 1935, a leaf blight spread among the closely grouped trees as they matured, The disease spread like wildfires. As the trees grew, their crowns began to touch. Ooh, don't want to touch crowns. Don't want to touch crowns. And that was docking. (laughs) Was troublesome and turned catastrophic. The fungus hit the older trees the hardest. Oh, you don't want to get fungus when you're docking. No. Uh, Bad visual. (laughs) Bad visual. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Don't touch my crown. You're gonna give me your fungus. I don't want your fungus. Crown fungus. (laughs) <laughs> the fungus uh, slowly suffocated the trees. None of the trees that Ford had planted were engineered to be resistant to this fungus as they were designed for Southeast Asia. The location of Fordlandia made matters worse. The humidity and fog from the river uh, promoted the spore growth. In nature, trees help avoid infection by shedding their leaves, but that wasn't possible with how closely they were all planted. By mid-1936... This has been going on for almost 10 years now. Yeah. (laughs) Just give up. Just stop. Fordlandia stood patchy and ragged just at the moment it should have been producing its first rubber export. Honestly, just give up. Most of Fordlandia's Fordlandia's residents and workers had left. They were just like, this shit ain't gonna work. They were like, this place sucks. (laughs) We're rioting. Look, I was hopeful for the first five years that I was here, but I'm I'm done. When are we going to get toilets? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, all those guys had left, except for a few Americans and a skeleton skeleton crew of Brazilian workers. I'm just Spooky. imagining, like, literal skeletons working. Yeah. That'd be kind of sick, actually. He's so sick. He's so metal. <laughs> I wish we had, like, a skeleton editor. That'd be tight. Yeah, dude, if we could, like, put a spell on a skeleton... And then it had like a personality, and it was really funny. It loved to yeah. party. Yeah. <laughs> it was like so fun. Had a goatee for some reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just like party, but like not in a way that made us sad. Yeah. It was just like happy party. <laughs> like I'd want, uh, I'd want a skeleton with like Henry's personality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Henry's like a freelance editor that yeah. work, comes in and works for us sometimes when we get real busy. And that dude's chill AF. Yeah, man. Oh, shit. Henry, what's his last name? Henry, Henry Drayton. Yeah. Shout out to Henry Drayton, a.k.a. Hide After Chef. Uh, go check out our musical episode of Wheelhouse if you want to see what Henry looks like. <laughs> He's a really good rapper, too. Love Henry. Um, on that note, ads. Hunga bunga. Oh, I'm bald. That's what I hear when I hear a bald man talk to me. Ugh. Unless you're Dr. Phil, you don't really look good when you're balding. Luckily, you don't have to go bald thanks to Keeps. With today's advancements in science, Keeps offers proven treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair you have. All for half the cost of whatever you would get at the pharmacy. In addition to being one of the most affordable options for hair loss prevention, Keeps has revolutionized the way you get your treatments. No longer do you have to go to the doctor, wait in line, talk to some schlub that would rather be golfing. Now you can visit a doctor online and get your treatments shipped directly to your home. Find out why Keeps has more five-star ratings than anyone else and has nearly 100,000 men trusting Keeps for their hair loss prevention medication. Keeps treatments start at just $10 a month. Plus, for a limited time, you can get your first month free. That's one hell of a deal for getting to keep your hair. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, head over to keeps.com slash gas to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash G-A-S. 
Thank you, Keeps, for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, talk about your poops. Dude, it just <laughs> ravaged me. Was it hot? It was every like every bad thing you could experience. Why is your poop so hot sometimes? I don't know. Is it because it's spicy or is it actually hot? Because sometimes you get a real hot feeling. Why is your poop hot? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> it auto, it auto feels sometimes. It's a weird ad That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, burning diarrhea. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> mm. What causes causes eating spicy foods? Hemorrhoids, irritable mm. bowel syndrome, IBS. These aren't the answers I'm looking for. Yeah. By this time, most of Fordlandia's residents and workers had left, except for a few Americans and a skeleton crew of Brazilian workers. At some point during all of this, a few years earlier, about 500,000 acres of Fordlandia land had been traded for the same amount of land located about <laughs> 70 miles away on a flat plateau named Belterra. Because, you know... Why not? This is all going so well... <laughs> Let's make part of it 70 miles away. <laughs> because of how flat Belterra was, it was easier to lay it out to resemble a normal Midwestern town. That's the problem. We're designing a town, but we can't design it like a Midwestern town. Yeah. It's not like the towns that we see. Uh -huh. It's like a savage town. <laughs> so, like, I'm just, okay, I just need to find some land that looks like the Midwest, yeah. and then my brain can think like where I'm from, and then I can just make a town with straight streets and roads, like the like the mat that I play with my Legos on, <laughs> and my Hot Wheels, my Hot Wheels carpet in my house. That's the problem. That's the problem. You're right. That's the problem. A new hospital was constructed in this town and was known as the Mayo Clinic of the Amazon. Apparently, all workers that died were subjected to a non-consensual autopsy in the name of science. That's hmm. what want. Sounds familiar. In late 1936, uh, things were looking fine for the entire Amazon project. About 700,000 trees were planted at Belterra now, and a few more were planted at the old Fordlandia location. Uh, the blight also began to show here, but there was some hope. Due to the flatness of the ground, it was easier for workers to clean and prune the leaves to prevent the disease from spreading. The issue at Belterra was not with disease, but now bugs instead. Bugs. <laughs> there had never been a rubber estate in the area, which meant snack time for all them little buggies, especially the lace bug. Spiders started winding webs around machinery, starting them, causing them to short circuit. That's a lot of web. That's a lot of webs. And to top it all off, mole-type animals <laughs> began eating the tree stumps. <laughs> In five hours, they collected an estimated 250,000 oh moth caterpillars, filling 51-gallon buckets. That's a lot of protein. When more were found, they dumped the caterpillars into a large pile and set it on fire. That's not nice. <laughs> Damn. Things continued, to de things continued to deteriorate as the trees began to grow. By 1940, 1940. They've <laughs> been doing this for so long. The leaf blight. More money than cents, you know. Yeah. With a C, cents, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the leaf blight that was always present at Belterra turned into an epidemic and began to decimate the rubber crop. There was some hope, though. This is like a... A roller coaster. As the next year, Belterra managed to produce 750 million tons of poor quality latex, much better than the previous 50 million tons they had been managing. That is a good improvement. In 1942, the moths have had adopted to the human adapted. interference, adapted to the human interference, and began laying their eggs higher Boy. in the trees where people couldn't see them. <laughs> this paired with a terrible blight and a drought uh, was not good for the company. <laughs> Some areas. Quote, some areas are now as bare as bean poles. Henry Ford's son, Etzel, wrote to Harvey Firestone's son, Harvey, <laughs> <laughs> offering him the rights to buy Belterra. But Firestone already had resounding success with his own plantations in Liberia. So he was like, nah, dude, uh, 
I have a good rubber plant because my dad's not super, super duper racist. He's only a little bit normal back then racist. At this point, uh, it should be noted, um, Henry Ford has, I think, ceded a little bit of control of the company. Mm -hmm. He's only a, he's a few years from death now, but I think he's still kind of controlling things from the, the yeah. wings. But uh, Edsel like, Ford's in in control. Mm. Um, so at this point, both Fordlandia and Belterra had become subsidi subsidiaries of the U.S. government because you know World War Two. Dub dub two. By incorporating the government into the program, Ford hoped that he would be able to turn a profit by selling rubber to the U.S. military at an above market that'll, price. Yeah, that'll work out. Uh, this plan failed, though, as the plantation could barely produce enough rubber to sell due to all the infestations and diseases to offset the operating costs. A few years later, the plantation took on its final role as yet another embassy in South America. As the book puts it, quote, Ford's Amazon plantations assumed their final incarnation, useful embassies of FDR's wartime good neighbor policy, staging around for New Deal diplomacy in the Amazon. Although the plantations were failures, the cities were, quote, shining examples of the American dream. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I call them that. <laughs> Riots and no toilets. Both Fordlandia and Belterra had become obligatory layovers for travel writers writing about the Good Neighbor Alliance. Walt Disney even d visited once. Another anti-Semite. Yep. Three years after his visit, with the help of a video provided by the Ford Motor Company, Disney released a documentary called... Probably wasn't a video. No. Probably film. Yes, film. Disney released a documentary called The Amazon Awakens, in which Ford's town was featured as one of their four great cities in the Amazon. In fact, it was at Fordlandia that Walt Disney first envisioned his idea of Disneyland, a place where he would blend different experiences of the time, stagecoaches, riverboats, railroads of the frontier, and Main Street, USA. Tomorrowland would point to the future, and Adventureland had a jungle river cruise called Amazon Bell. Fordlandia and Belterra's hospitals and research stations were put to use as research labs to improve the health and conditions of the people of the Amazon, in 1942, the Air Force demanded a runway be built in Belterra so the U.S. had somewhere to stash some planes. Quote, Fordlandia and Belterra were, in effect, nationalized, both practically producing rubber tree clones, research, harboring U.S. military equipment, and symbolically. In 1943, Edsel Ford died. He was acting leader of the Ford Motor Company at the time, and the position was passed down to his son... Hank the Deuce. That's right. Henry Ford the Second. When good old Hank was put in, when good old Hank was put in charge, the conditions at Ford Motor Ford Motor Company had gone to absolute hell. Millions of dollars in product was being stolen from factories yearly, and the business had no central oversight system to manage its 130,000 employees. To help consolidate the company's assets just a little. Henry Ford decided to sell many of his grandfather's village industries, which had now become total money sinks. Henry Ford II became the president of Ford Motor Company on September 21, 1945. On November 5th, he turned over Fordlandia and Belterra, valued at $8 million, with over $20 million invested into it by Ford, to the Brazilian government for $244,000. <laughs> It was just oh. like, yo, dude, just, let's get this shit out of here yeah. immediately. <laughs> Fire sale. Jeez. Whatever you got, we'll take it. Yep, and that was just enough money to cover the severance pay for all the employees down well, at- At least you can give them yeah. severance. Like, I hope so. Fordlandia and Belterra have been closed ever since. Reporters wrote that anyone other than Henry Ford would have surrendered years ago. But Ford persisted, even when there was no hope- of ever turning a profit with his failed utopia. His Amazon utopia turned out to be one of the biggest failures the company had ever endured and proved to be a testament to both the ingenuity and genius of one of the most influential and sort of terrible industrialists in America. I would just say terrible. Yeah. Yeah, asshole. <laughs> and after, even though this was a huge, you know, over a decade long shit fire. It's still not as offensive as Ford calling that SUV thing a Mustang. <laughs> what a way to close up. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you.
you. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, that's just a terrible story. And I don't feel good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't feel good at all. It's like watching a really sad movie. I feel like I just watched, uh, what's that one? Whatever. There's a lot of sad ones. <laughs> it's like watching E.T. No. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. That was not fun. And it's like racist dudes with a lot of <laughs> zeal. Who just think they know everything. Just think they know everything. Don't learn the language. Send a ton of people down there like people with die. shady information. Yeah. Just failing for ever and just screwing up so many people's lives and the I look, environment. I think there's something to be said about the power of like perseverance and just sheer will of getting stuff done. But like there's a lot of situations where that doesn't apply and you need people's help. This is one of those stories where yeah. it's like you need to know what you're doing. I mean there were times when like we thought Donut wasn't gonna last, yeah. you know, because we didn't have any money. But this is like fire Festival. Yeah. You know, like it's just like I think you to be that kind of guy, you just have to have this never say die attitude. But sometimes you gotta say die. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He's just like, no, you know, just don't give up. Well just keep doing it. But like the person saying like we'll never give up is saying it from thousands of miles away in his huge freaking mansion. And he's like, no, just don't just keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. Just keep going. You guys are obviously aren't trying. Look, if you want to be like me, you got to be like me. Just keep trying. Yeah. Like, uh, thank you so much for listening to Podcast, James. I'm so glad to have you back. Dude. Yeah, and I'm so glad to be back. This is my favorite thing to do. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably know about our YouTube channel. But if you don't, check us out yeah. on YouTube. It's at Donut Media. We're also on Instagram and Twitter at Donut Media. We got a Facebook. got a Facebook group. We got our subreddit. Yeah, just r slash Donut Media. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at James Pumphrey. Follow Nolan at Nolan. Jay Sykes. Thank you. Uh, be nice. Be nice. I love you. Go buy some merch at donutmedia.com. We got a bunch of new stuff in there. Just fucking gramming, dude. I'm just gramming right now. Okay. Just gramming. Gramming it to the man. Gramming it to the man. That's when you use social media <laughs> to influence social change. Yeah. That's what all my, um, you know, self indulgent posts do.